going to give you the, the background. Okay. Second Timothy was written by Paul. Actually, Bible commentators say that it was his last word. Okay, it was his last letter. If you read it carefully, we'll get to the end. Before the letter actually got to Timothy, they beheaded Paul. Yes, they chopped off his head. <laughs> he knew the end was near. Okay? So he wrote the book of um, Second Timothy to Timothy. Now, the book of Second Timothy was written, as I said to you before, by Paul, okay, for three reasons. Three reasons. First of all, Paul was lonely. If you read, if you read it carefully, you will see Paul was lonely. He was very lonely. And if you once you get into it, you will, you will see more of it. He was saying, at the time of my first hearing, no one stood with me. He said, Demas has forsaken me for the love of this present world. Then he started to mention people. Um, you know, John Mark has gone. This one has gone. That one has gone. They all forsook me. Only Luke is left with me. Everybody for Just imagine, you know, you are in that situation. Now, this is a mighty, mighty man of God. You know what usually happens, especially um, human nature, when things are going all right with you, when everything is okay, you have lots of friends. You know, we usually have a saying, failure is an orphan, but success is a family man. Everybody wants to hang around the man that is successful. Everybody wants to cheer you up. Everybody wants to say, right on. Everybody wants to associate with you. You see? They want to have dinner with you. They want to come to your house. They want to do everything when things are going all right. But when Paul was in prison, and this was his last prison. He went to prison many times. But this was the last one. You know, everybody forsook him. So number one reason why he wrote the book of Timothy was that he was lonely. And because he was lonely, he wrote this letter to Timothy, actually asking Timothy to come to him. Okay? You know, that's why sometimes you look around this world, you know, the you know, people who do leadership, um, you know, training and leadership development, they usually say leadership is a very lonely place. A very lonely place because you know, you don't know who to talk to. You don't know um, who to trust in. You could tell somebody, you know, something and you think you're confiding in them before you know what is happening. They've taken what you said out of context and they've gone and shared the whole thing to the whole world and say, oh, look at this man that you think is a mighty man of God. Oh, look at the things he's struggling with. Look at all this and that. You know, Paul was in this situation where he was very lonely and needed somebody to talk to. Who else than Timothy? Because Timothy is a young man that he brought up, you know, by himself. You know, he knew he could trust him. He knew he's somebody he could confide in. You see, he knew that he had basically raised Timothy in the faith. And this man was also a comfort to him as well. So he longed for that fellowship. That's one number one reason why Paul wrote the book of Second Timothy, okay? The second reason was because, you see, if you look at the life of this man, he spent a large portion of his life establishing the church, okay? Planting churches here and there and visiting them, you know, missionary journeys and everything. And sometimes when you read the Bible, you've got to understand that it really cost this man everything. It cost him everything. Even when he was traveling, you know, if you remember his missionary journeys, he said, you know, I, I was stoned and left for dead. That's what, at, at a place called Lystra, which is where Timothy actually came from. They stoned the man and put him outside the city gate and left him for dead. But God miraculously raised him up. Okay? There was a time where people bound themselves together and they made a vow that they will not eat or drink until Paul is dead. You see? Now then there was a time where the Jews captured him and they gave him 40 save one. You see? 
and there was a, all sorts of things. There was a riot in the city because of Paul. You know, he was put in prison. Remember Paul and Silas? They began to pray, and then the Holy Ghost came down. He was beat. This man suffered for the gospel. He suffered to lay the foundation that we all now enjoy today. Okay? So, Apostle Paul knows that, look, I spent most of my life, I spent all my energy, my usefulness, my life, establishing the church. So he wrote this book to Timothy as an encouragement, okay, but also as a charge to Timothy to uphold the good work. We're going to see all of them shortly. Uphold the good work. Timothy, I spent all my life establishing the gospel, bringing revelation knowledge, you know, telling you what's right and what is not. Timothy, do all you can to uphold this gospel. Do all you can to make sure that you preach this gospel with boldness. You may actually suffer the way I've suffered, but don't care because we know the Lord who we, who we believe in. Okay, and this is the truth. So that was the second reason why he wrote the book of Timothy. So that there will be, so, it's like for me, it's like pass, passing the baton to the next generation. Okay, you remember Timothy was a younger man. Okay, and at that time, Paul was, you know, a bit older. Okay, I can't remember how old he was, but you know, he was older. He's passing the baton to the next generation and giving them a charge to say, don't let this gospel be diluted in any way. Stand your ground. Everything that I've taught you so far, make sure that's what you teach. No addition, no subtraction. Hold fast to the gospel. The third reason why he wrote the book of 2 Timothy was because Paul also wanted to encourage the church. He wanted to encourage the church. You see, that's the sort of man that he was. Even though he was in prison, and if you read it, if you read the, the, the first chapter where we are going to read, okay, you see that Paul was in prison, but then he even his friends didn't know where he was. We're going to read it. They said they were looking, they, nobody knew where they imprisoned him. They didn't know where he was. So this man was isolated, he was lonely, and that's because he was imprisoned by a very wicked emperor called Nero. Okay? It was the emperor Nero that actually imprisoned Apostle Paul. Okay? Everyone still with me? So, what happened is that you've got to understand about this man, he was a terrible man. As an emperor, he was terrible. Okay? First of all, his grand uncle was the emperor. And the grand uncle married his mom. And the grand uncle convinced, I'm oh, sorry, the mom convinced the grand uncle to um, adopt Nero as his son. Okay? But then what happens is that because the mom wanted Nero to become the next emperor, what happened was that they gave the emperor poison. They gave him mushroom soup poison, and they poisoned him, and he died, and then Nero became emperor. But he was only 17, and because he was young, guess what? The mom was actually ruling Rome, mm. you see? And that was her plan all the while. So even though Nero was there as, as the emperor, he was just a figurehead, the mom was ruling, okay? But Nero was a very bad man, very bad. When he discovered that the mom had a lot of influence over him, he hated the mom. He hated the mom. I'll tell you more. His grand uncle, remember, had a son as well. Okay? He made sure that that uh, the son of his uncle, so that he would have no competition, he made sure that that man was killed. He killed him. He killed a lot of people in his time. A lot. So he killed that man, and his mom, he actually killed his mom. Eventually, he killed his mom. Because as he was growing and growing and growing, you know, time will fail me to go into all the history, the, more, the, the, the older he, he became, the more he wanted power. Okay? The more he didn't want his mom 
to control him anymore. So the mom moved out of the palace. She had her own mansion somewhere, okay? And then eventually he had her, uh, you know, executed and murdered, okay? And then it gets even worse. <laughs> he married his wife that he married. He had her murdered and killed so that he could marry his mistress. And eventually, he ended up killing that mistress as well. He was a terrible, terrible man, okay? But one of the things that happened was that under Nero, Christianity suffered. Christians suffered a lot under Nero. In fact, persecution rose under Nero. Again, one of the highlights of this man was that when he was emperor, <laughs> He, he always convinced, he, he, he told everybody and he saw himself as a singer, musician. That's what he loved. Power, food, women, you know. He, some historians say he was actually also going out with men. He was going out with men, going out with women. <laughs> but he loved food and power and everything. Everything that is just, you know, exuberance. But then he loved art. Instead of ruling the, the nation, he spent all his time in art and music and everything, and he started singing. Guess what? If he's singing, you, he asks you, what do you think of my singing? Everybody say he's good. <laughs> you are such a wonderful singer because if you say he's not good, he can <laughs> he kill you. Okay? Even his mentor, and he eventually killed a lot of people. His mentor, everybody. So, but one of the things that happened was that during his reign, okay, he went to, uh, he left Rome and went to one of his uh, games and, you know, music show in one of his palaces, okay? And when he was there, what then happened was that there was a fire in Rome, okay? And the fire was terrible for about 14 days or so. The, there was heavy fire that burnt a lot of, you know, huge portion of Rome and a lot of people died, okay? So that's why they refer to Nero as the emperor who slept while Rome was burning, okay? But luckily for him, immediately he heard the news, he came back to, to Rome and they tried to put the fire out. When they put the fire out, guess what? He said it was the Christians that started the fire. Guess what will happen? Everybody then hated Christians. So it actually became a death sentence to say that you are a Christian. You know, there was a lot of uprising against the church, against Christians. They were just killing them, burning them on the stake. They were just all sorts of atrocities against Christians. So that was the emperor rule. And he did a lot of other atrocities. Actually, he, he fought against um, Israel fought against Jerusalem and you know conquered it and everything. He sent his um, his military um, man who was a very good military tactician. His name was Titus. He sent him to to Jerusalem. Remember when Jesus cried over the temple and he said, "Oh Jerusalem, you know I wish um, you know this temple none of the stone will remain." Well, um, Nero sent Titus to go to. Uh, Rome, uh, sorry, to Jerusalem, and that was when actually the Jews started it first. Okay, the Jews started it and they killed a lot of Roman soldiers. Then there was a punitive uh, mission in which they totally, you know, quashed the whole of uh, Israel and they went to Jerusalem and you know, destroyed the whole thing, including the temple. Okay, so just to give you a background, this is the era that Paul was living in. This is the era where he wrote this book, okay? It's like waking up one day and you just see that everything you've worked for all your life oh. is all crumbling before your own eyes. So it was a very difficult time for the apostle. Apart from that, he was in prison, he was cold, you know, before, okay, some of the previous prisons where Apostle Paul had been, he was under house arrest, okay? house arrest. People were still coming to visit. This time it was different. He was, he was in chains. 
you know, it was total annihilation. And we're going to see in the last chapter, you know, he, he ended up being beheaded. Okay, so let's start now from um, 2 Timothy chapter 1. We start from verse 1. The Apostle Paul wrote, he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that with that season I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. You see what I told you before that he wrote this book because he was lonely. He wanted somebody to fellowship with. He wanted somebody to talk to. Amen. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that in thee also. You see, this is very, very important here because you see Paul is talking to Timothy now and he said, I'm convinced that you have God in you. I'm convinced of the, of the Spirit of God in you. But it didn't start with you. He was able to trace the faith of Timothy back to the third generation. generation. Amen? So that's why even us as parents, it's very, very important. Okay? And every time here we stress it, very, very important, you know, you make sure your children know about God. Because what happens is that they eventually will pass it on. Okay? If you remember from First Timothy, one of the things that we said that his father was Greek, yeah. but his mother was Jewish. You see? So which means his mother was able to pass across to him, you know, the faith in the Jewish God. Until he met Apostle Paul and everything just changed. Mm. You see? So even when we have children, it's, you know, most times I know it's, it's, it's hard, but what I've come to discover is that most people say to their children, so long as you are under 16, you have no choice. You have to come with me to church. Okay? But when you are 16, you are free to make up your mind. I think. Guess what? 16. Most of them, when they are 16, 16, then they make up their mind and they go to the world. So what's happened is that the child is just waiting for the clock, <laughs> on the clock to tick, 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 tick. Once they are 16, now I can do what I like. Yeah. You see? Whereas, if we take the opposite approach and actually teach them what it means to be a believer, teach them what it means you know, for, for you to be a child of God, that this thing is not just a religion. Church is not a place that we go to. Church is who we are. Yeah. I am a church. That's it. Yes. Because your body, the Bible says, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Yes. Okay? I know we all come together to fellowship and to, you know, build up one another. But ultimately, every one of us, we are the vessels That's of right. God. You see? But when we do not pass this on to our children, or when we do not even understand it ourselves, then it becomes a problem. Okay? It becomes a problem because you find out that after a generation, Christianity usually dies with many, many families. You see, a family that should be a godly generation, you know, it just fizzles out. And even many, many churches close down. In Australia, yep. we're not talking about, in Australia, many, many churches close down because they're not able to close this generational gap. The fathers and the mothers did not teach the children the way of the Lord. Yep. And so what happens is that after some time, you know, when all the, 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 the men and the women become old and they die off, there's no offspring to replace them. You see? But Paul is saying here, your grandmother taught your mother, and your mother taught you. Mm. So I'm confident of the faith that you have. Amen. So as parents, it is our duty. It's our duty. Amen. 
Verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stay up the gift of God which is in thee, by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. So here is Apostle Paul again. Remember what I told you before? So one of the reasons why he wrote this book was to charge Timothy. He was passing on the baton to the next generation. And here he is telling Timothy, you know, the gift of God that is in you, fan it to flame. Don't let that gift of God that is in you lie dormant. Amen. Don't let the gift of God that is in you go to waste. You've got the spirit of God in you. You've got the anointing of God in you. Put it to use. Amen. And this is the same message for every one of us here today. God does not have idiots. God never created idiots. Once you are a child of God, his spirit is in you. The Bible says, if this same spirit that is Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he will quicken your mortal body. What does that mean? He will make you come alive. Amen. Hallelujah. So the spirit of God, the anointing of God is in you, but from now, every now and then, you need to be reminded of who you are. You need to be reminded of what you carry. So here is Apostle Paul telling him, look, don't, you remember in 1 Timothy, he, 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 he said to Timothy, don't let any man despise your youth. Don't let any man say because you are young, they're just going to you know, make rubbish of you. No, you need to be able to stand up for the gospel. You need to be able to stand up for what you believe in. Because I know the gift of God is in you. And I stand here this evening and I echo the words of Apostle Paul. Everyone hearing the sound of my voice this evening, the gift of God is in you. Amen. You just need to exercise it. Amen. Hallelujah. Just as Apostle Paul encouraged Timothy and said, you know, don't let any man put you aside. And exercise the gift of God in you. How will you know if you don't do something? If we always are timid, you see, that's why in the next verse, in the next verse, he said, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. If you read it in another translation, he said, God has given us the spirit of boldness yes, and of courage, okay, and of self-discipline. What does that mean? It means that the reason why we are not exercising the gift of God is because we are afraid. You see? It's because we are afraid. Or oh, some of you go, oh, to be honest, I'm not really afraid. Yes, you are afraid, okay? Because here it is, okay? If you are ashamed, Fear and shame are actually the same thing. Yep. That's right. yes. Why are you ashamed? Because you are afraid of what people might say about you. Yes. Right. Of what people might think about you. That's why you are afraid. That's why you are pulling back. Amen. You see, when you come across somebody and they say, I have a headache. Okay? Just say, look, do you mind if I pray with you? It doesn't take 10 heads. You say, what if they don't get hit? Then I'm going to be embarrassed. Then they're going to think, oh, oh, it didn't work. Well, that's actually not for you to decide. That's right. That's right. Amen. Our job is to step forth in faith. Once you step forth in faith, God will do the rest. That's right. Amen. You know, I remember vividly, you know, uh, the, the, the man of God, Kenneth Hagin, that and he said, you know, this voice was telling him, what if they don't get healed? What if I pray for somebody and they don't get healed? And he replied, what if they get healed? You see? What if I pray for somebody and they get healed? You see, the truth is that because we're processing the consequences of what will happen when the person doesn't get healed, or if something doesn't happen the way we, we prayed it, we are thinking of the consequences. That's why we don't do it. You see? Oh, what if, you know, I pray for... God to bless him and God doesn't bless him. What if I pray for him, you know, to, to get this job and he doesn't get the job? Mm. What if this? What if that? What if I boldly proclaim mm. that I'm a child of God? What if I boldly proclaim? You know, some people are afraid to say that sickness cannot come near them. You know, because they think, oh, if I say it, the sickness will really try and come. <laughs> if I say that sickness cannot come near me, 
That's when sickness will actually come and attack me, or the devil will come and attack me. You see? To the unbeliever, they say, oh, uh, you know, you might just attract the wrath of, of sickness by the time you start saying, oh, see, sickness cannot, you know, come near me. But the truth is, the gift of God is in every one of us. Remember the parable of the talent. How many of you remember? The parable of the talent. Yes. Jesus gave a parable and he said the rich man was going away and he called the servant and gave unto them talent. What does that tell me? It means that God does not have anybody in his house who he hasn't given anything to. Because the man didn't leave any of his servants behind. He gave everyone something. One he gave how many? Ten? The other he gave five. The other he gave one. Yeah. You see, we all might have different capabilities. Mm. Okay? We all might also have what I call capacity. Mm. Because not everybody has the same capacity. Some people have the capacity to pray. They can, you know, they, they, they can pray and pray and pray. Some people have the capacity to endure. Mm. You know, some people are, you know, we all have different giftings. Mm. Amen. That's why what Apostle Paul talks about, you know, all the body cannot just be the mouth. Okay, there are different giftings in the body of Christ. Your job and your responsibility is to recognize, is to discover your own gifting and then put it to work. That's actually your job. Nobody's going to come and discover it for you. Right. Amen. As a pastor, you'd be surprised how many, many people are looking up to me to say, yeah, yes, you are an evangelist. I'm not the one who will tell you are an evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> discover it by yourself. <laughs> Amen. Why should you? My job is to encourage you. That's right. Amen. It's not to because if I do that, you know what? I've taken away your own dignity. Doesn't the Bible say it is the duty of the king to find out something? And it's the honor of God to conceal it. That's it. So you find it out by yourself. Amen. You find it out by yourself. Our job is to nurture you, is to encourage you. Amen. Is to, you know, to make sure you are pointed in the right direction. But you find it out by yourself and they start living it. Amen. Amen. God has not given us the spirit of fear. He has given us the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. That means if we have a sound mind, we can conceive and we can do anything. Amen. 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 But mind you, like I told you before, Apostle Paul was encouraging this young man, don't give up. Don't give up. You've got to carry this baton and let this light shine. Verse um, 8. Sound mind, Pastor, it's mind set on God. No, sound, sound mind, mind is, what? Is, is, um, a sound mind is, is, um, is, a healthy mind to put it easily is somebody who is mentally strong yeah he's mentally strong he's got self-discipline yes. yeah if you read it in amplified yes. yeah self-discipline self-control self -control, yes. that's what sound the mind, sound is. mind is, yeah. yeah it's you know it's mentally yeah. strong and that's what God has given us again I know so many people are not gonna like this that's why I don't believe that depression is for the child of God. That's why I don't believe that. Because here's the Bible saying we've got a sound mind. Sound mind. Okay? Depression and sound mind cannot walk hand in hand. That's why we have the Spirit of God. He's giving us a sound mind. Hallelujah. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against it. Okay, verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. Let's stop there a little bit. I love that. Don't be ashamed of me a prisoner. Mm -hmm. Now, you've got to put this into context, okay? Now, you all have got Pastor William here, and I know a lot of people look up to him. But let's say tomorrow, <laughs> For one reason or the other, whether he's innocent or he's guilty, okay, he ends up in jail. I bet you, many people 
would dissociate themselves from him. Completely. <laughs> quick, as quick as they can. Completely. They would dissociate themselves with it, you know, from him. You know why? Nobody wants to be associated Some. with mm -hmm. you know, a prisoner. Mm -hmm. The truth is that when you go to prison, nobody cares why you went to prison. That's right. <laughs> all, they, all they remember is prison. Mm. Yeah? And prison is a place for criminals. Mm. They don't want to know whether you were innocent or whether they were seen just or they don't care. Oh, as convicts. <laughs> run, run away from him. You see? That's why Paul, uh, Paul had to write this letter to Timothy and say, Don't be ashamed of me. Okay? Because he's, he was his spiritual father, he was his mentor. Okay? It's, look, even though everybody is forsaking me, you know, people don't want anything to do with me because I'm in prison. But well, don't be ashamed of me. But more importantly, don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. And it's the same message today. The gospel might not seem glamorous. Mm. You know, Apostle Paul said to them that perish, this gospel is like foolishness. You know, whether your family members understand you, whether your friends understand you, whether they think you're no longer cool, they think, oh, this guy, you know, he doesn't get it anymore. It doesn't matter. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. You know why? It is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. Apostle Peter said, there's no, there's no salvation in any other way. There's no other name given among men Whereby we must be saved. Only one name. Hallelujah. And that's the name of Jesus. Therefore, as Christians, okay, we should not be ashamed of our best, of our identity. Mm. It is who we are. Mm. Now I want you to remember this was written at a time of great persecution. You see, when we stand here today, it's easy. It's easy, really, really easy. You know why? Because, you know, if somebody tried to persecute you, uh, you say, I've got my right, I've got my freedom, I've got this. Back in the day, they didn't have anything. In fact, if you kill a Christian in a certain era, people hail you. Yeah. yeah. Because you killed a Christian. Yeah. Because they saw Christians as a cult. They saw yes. Christianity as, you know, the, the enemy of the state. Yes. That's how Nero painted, you know, the whole of, um, you know, Christianity. You know, but unfortunately, I didn't tell you about Nero, how he ended. The man, after he did all the atrocities that he committed, he eventually committed suicide. Wow. He had to take his own life because, you know, he lost it. You know, the, the, the empire, people got fed up of, of him and they wanted to overthrow him. Okay? And the soldiers were coming to take him and actually he ran. They declared him enemy of the state, number one. <laughs> That's after he was overthrown from being emperor, you know. And then what happened was that he knew that he ran and he tried to hide. When he got tired of running, he knew there was nowhere else to run. And he didn't want to be taken as a prisoner. Because what happens is that those if they take you as a prisoner, it doesn't matter whether you were the emperor, they'll take you out in the street and flog you. And he didn't want that humiliation, so he took his own life. Amen. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Mm. But it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who had abolished death and had brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. So here is Apostle Paul giving a charge to this young man. I say it doesn't matter what's going on around you. Hallelujah. Whether people like Christians or they don't like Christians, do not deny the Lord. And let me be honest with you, during that time of persecution, if you go back and study the early church, many, many Christians denied Jesus. 
many of them because as you would appreciate not everybody was able to stand the persecution not everybody was able to surrender their head and say cut it off <laughs> okay because that's what Paul did okay so many Christians basleded actually one of the things that also happened is that so many Christians left the urban areas and they all retreated to the mountainside okay the ones that didn't want to renounce their faith okay they just ran away from the cities because there's more persecution in the cities than there, there was in the you know countryside and in the mountain hills there's no one there okay they just go and form communities of their own okay but what apostle paul was trying to tell uh, timothy here is that don't be ashamed because we know that what we have is the real deal it's the real deal because we know that jesus is the only son of god and he was made manifest in the flesh he saved us and he died for our sins and is giving unto us life Amen. And it's brought us from mortality to immortality. Because guess what? Everyone that believes in Jesus, okay? We don't hear this a lot of times, but don't forget, we're going to reign with him. Hallelujah. We're going to reign with him. Apostle Paul said, the things that lie ahead of us, yeah? The glory that lie ahead of us is much more than the persecution that we are suffering right now. Therefore, Timothy, you do everything you can. Do not give up. Hold on to this gospel. Mm. Hallelujah. Because what we have, we know that what we have is the real thing. Mm. Don't give it up. Don't give it up. It's what Jesus suffered for. Mm. It's what Jesus died for. Hallelujah. The Bible says, what manner of love mm. the Father has given unto us mm. that we should be called the sons of God. You know, sometimes as Christians, what usually happens is that when we face persecution, okay, when things don't work out the way that we do, and I can tell you from experience, the number one thing people do is to cut our church. That's the number one thing they do. And I've seen this over and over and over and over again. It's like, it's, it's like watching a movie. I see it every time. Once people come against any difficulty in their life, okay, things that are not working out exactly the way they plan or the way they think is going to, you know, that is going to work out, or they are sick, or, or something happens, they, they have, you know, marriage issues, job issues. The first thing they cut out from their life is church. They stop coming to church. They stop, you know, worshiping with the brethren. They stop praying. Whereas, that's actually the time. That you should not forsake God. That's right. Because somehow, somehow, okay, everybody listening to me? Yes. Somehow, somehow, we have this notion in our heads. And the church of today has not actually done Christianity much favor today. We, the, the church has painted the picture, God is good all the time. Okay? Therefore, Everything is going to be rosy, 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 and good all the time. God is good all the time, yes. God is good all the time because he doesn't change, okay? But the fact that you are going through persecution, the fact that you are going through difficulties, does not mean that God has changed. That's right. You see? But we have the expectation that everything must be good and rosy all the days of our life because we trust in God. No. No. Being a Christian, sometimes there, there, some things come with it. Sometimes you're going to experience some toughness. Sometimes you're going to experience some things that are unpleasant. You know what? That is what makes you strong. Yeah. Yeah. That's what makes you strong. But we sort of had this notion, ah, if things are not working out for Tom, ah, ah confess your sins, brother. <laughs> confess your sins. What, what, what have you been do doing this? wrong? Mm. You know, what sin have you been committing? It's not always like that. It's a journey. Hallelujah. And God is making every one of us strong. Mm. I will never forget this analogy, and I say it to people every time. Positive, positive. It cannot produce power. Yeah? yeah? If, I don't know how many of you, you get your remote at home, or, you know, your battery operated toy or anything. You bring, oh, let me just put the battery. You put positive into positive. Yeah, the two of them facing positive. Po you, why is it not working? What's going on? Why is this thing not working? 
positive positive cannot produce power. In the same way, negative negative cannot produce power. It's a negative and a positive put together. That's where you get power from. But today, nobody wants negative. Oh, it's not my question. <laughs> yeah? You know, sometimes, even during weddings, you know, people are, they want to change the, the marriage bar. You know how we say in sickness and in health. No, 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 pastor, no. Oh, in sickness my. and in goodness. Yeah? <laughs> no, 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 no sickness. Yeah? In health and in goodness. In health and in health. No. It's positive. No more that the marriages are crumbling. Because they haven't made an allowance in their mind for the negative. That's right. They just want positive, positive, positive all the way. And when you are like that, you can never produce power. That's right. That's why people are weak. Amen. So that's why Apostle Paul is trying to tell Timothy. Be strong. Things might not look very well now, but be strong. Hallelujah. But what happens is that these people, by their blood, laid the foundation of Christianity. You see, today, you know, we're very proud to say we belong to one big family, okay? And there are over a billion, over a billion Christians worldwide. But these people had to lay the foundation with their blood. Hallelujah. Amen. So, if when we come against challenges, that's the time we should remember God even the more. Yeah, that's the time we should pray the more. That's the time you should come to church right. the more. Amen. That's the time you should worship the, your God the more. I know it's hard. Yeah? I know it's hard. But you know what? That is when your strength is actually proven. Mm. That's when you will know, oh, I'm a strong Christian. I'm a strong mm. Christian. Oh, yeah, I'm a strong Christian. Yeah, you are a strong Christian until you face challenges. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You are a strong Christian until difficulties That's come. That's right. You are a strong Christian until you, 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 know, you have to swallow the, the unpalatable pill. That's when you know the, the level of your strength. Yeah. Yeah. You know what they say about a chain? What they say about a chain? A chain is only as strong as its weakest point. So you look at yourself, you know, when I'm stretched, how far can I go? That's right. Amen. But Apostle Paul is encouraging this young man here and saying, you know, this is the gospel. Mm -hmm. We know and we are convinced that this is the truth. We know and we are convinced that Jesus is the one and only true son of God. He died for our sins. He redeemed us from the curse of sin and death and we believe in him and we will hold on to this. Don't wave. Don't wave. Hold on to it. Okay, verse 11. Where also I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. <laughs> I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. This is a very bold statement. A very, very bold statement. Very bold statement. I know who I am believed, and I am not ashamed. You know, this is not the first time Apostle Paul is saying this, which means he must be speaking with great conviction. And that is one of the biggest problems that we have today. Men and women of conviction. Previously in Philippians, he has said it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. because it is the power of God mm -hmm. unto salvation. Here again he's saying it. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm in prison right now. You see, let's be honest. If you go to prison because you're a criminal, Okay, you stole something or you killed someone, then you know that you're truly suffering for your sin. Mm. Yeah, you remember the two thieves in the side of Jesus, yes. one on his right, one on his left, yes. and the other guy said, Haha, if you're truly the son of God, why don't you just save That's yourself right. and save me? Mm. Very stupid and foolish. 
Very stupid and very foolish. Because that wasn't the purpose of Jesus. Jesus knew why he was on the cross. It was part of the deal. It was part of the story, part of the destiny that he's going to go to the cross and be the sacrifice for the sin of us all. And then here is this criminal who, who has no idea, who doesn't know his right from his left, saying to him, uh, uh, why don't you just come down, save yourself and save me. <laughs> Some, sometimes... Sometimes when you think about these things, you say you feel like it is possible to just go back in time and give the man some. <laughs> the plan that God has been planning for ages. You want, at this last minute, you want to. You, <laughs> the devil is a terrible devil. <laughs> Even at this last minute, he still wants to spoil the plan. Oh yeah. He's been trying all along. He defeated Adam and Eve. That's not enough. He tempted Jesus, did everything. Now, at this last minute, when the deal is nearly done, you know, just come down, save yourself, and then save me. Jesus. <laughs> not a foolish man. Okay? But thank God, Jesus didn't have to answer him. <laughs> There's no need to answer him. The, the thief on the other side said, hey, this man is here and he's innocent. He hasn't committed any crime. Right. What about you? You are a criminal. Mm. You are suffering for your own sin. Yes. Okay? It's the same with Apostle Paul. He said, I'm in prison right now. It's, it's because of this gospel. Mm. If it were not for the gospel, I wouldn't be in prison. Yes. But you know what? I am still not ashamed. Yeah. I'm still not ashamed. Hallelujah. You know why? Because he had conviction. Mm. Conviction. And that is what is going to determine whether you go the extra mile or not. Conviction. That's what's going to determine whether you backslide halfway or not. That's what's going to determine whether you're going to keep pushing when things become hard. And it's also the reverse for some people. And I've seen it many times too. Things are hard. Then they start coming, coming to church and they believe in God. They prayers. Immediately God answers their, uh, their prayers. They do a U-turn and they back to where they're coming from. Okay? You know why? Because there's no conviction. There's no conviction. More than ever before, God is looking for and counting on men and women of conviction. Men and women of conviction. Without conviction, without being sure, okay, without having that hundred percent unwavering faith, and knowing that this path that I'm on is the right path, you know what will happen? You will turn around and go back. I don't know if how many of you have been lost before. Yeah, you've been lost. <laughs> <laughs> and you keep going, oh. yeah? And then you start to doubt, are you, are you sure this is the right way or not? Oh. Okay? Oh. If you have conviction that you're on the right path, you keep going. Yeah. Then you learn, end up in Sydney. Oh. <laughs> Thank God for that man. Okay. But if you have conviction and you know that this nerve man is always correct, <laughs> Josephine this this nerve man is right. Ah, the, 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 everything is correct. Then you keep following the <laughs> When you say turn right, you turn right. But sometimes you look and say, this doesn't look like. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> it doesn't look. Uh, believe me, it's happened to me. Okay? I, I just looked at this map and I knew that this thing is correct. And you know how the navigator sometimes is trying to find the shortest route, yeah. but it takes you through some very weird routes. <laughs> you thinking, is this? Yeah. But I believed in it. I think, oh, yeah, it's, it's correct. I trust them. <laughs> and I kept going. And going. It's taking me through the bush. All of a sudden, I'm alone. There's no car coming. There's no car going. <laughs> I'm on this narrow, narrow road. But I trust him because he's showing me my location. And he's showing me an arrow to say, this is, oh, I kept going. 
You go and go and go and go yeah. after half an hour. Hey, yes, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I made it. <laughs> you see, that's conviction. If if you're not convinced that this thing is correct, you do a U-turn, and then it will tell you <laughs> recalculating, <laughs> recalculating, and then you know. But if you have conviction, you just keep going. Or if you're familiar with the road, yes, yeah. you know sometimes. You're driving and you know your passenger is saying, Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure this is the right way? Because this this doesn't look like the right way to me. You say, Don't worry, don't worry. We're on the right path. You keep going. You keep going. <laughs> because you got conviction in you. And the yeah. is really yeah. <laughs> it looks like there are many people who have got the same, you know, the same experience. Yeah, you keep going because you're sure. Yeah. You know. The road up oh, or oh, we're going off road now. <laughs> but you keep going because you're convinced. You see? It's all about conviction. If you don't have the conviction, you turn around. Amen. It's the same with our Christian faith. If you have that conviction in you that this is the one only way. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And you're convinced that you are on this path. There is no going back. There's no turning back. What will happen? You keep going. You keep going. That's actually what happened to Apostle Paul. He's got that conviction. And that's because of the deep and intimate knowledge that he has of the Lord Jesus Christ. Many times you've heard, you've heard him say, I didn't get it from any man. I didn't confer with flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. This revelation, I know it comes from the Holy Ghost. I, mean. I, didn't, I didn't read it from any book. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always a difference. There's always a difference between the revelation or the thing that God showed you yes. and the thing that God revealed to you than the one that you read in the book. Oh, yes. very different. Books. <laughs> yeah, you could read the same book with somebody else, but the person does not see what you see. The person yes. does not have the same understanding yes. that you yes. have. Yes. That's why Matthew Luther read the word of God in Romans and he says, the just shall live by faith. Ah, he changed the whole world. They just shall live by faith. Six words. Change the whole world. The entire world. But ah. people have been reading it. <laughs> he wasn't the first person to read it. Many, many people have been reading it. You see, it didn't, it didn't mean anything to them. There was no conviction. There was nothing. But this man read it and I go, wow! The Catholic Church has been deceiving me all along. We live by faith, not by pen, uh, you know, by uh, confession, not by uh, penitence, not by paying money so that you know your relative that died many years ago will be released. No, no, no. Oh. We live <laughs> by faith, and that revolutionized the whole thing. Everybody understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's conviction, and for me, that is the prayer that I pray for every one of us. Hallelujah. That you know that God will shine His light Hallelujah. on His word. Mm. Bible says the word became flesh. When you come to that point where you're not just seeing black and white, you're seeing the word and you're seeing it flesh. That's the word that makes a difference in your life. That's the word that makes an impact in your life. And you go, wow, this thing is not just it's not just a story. It's not just, you know, uh, words about one man that lived many, many years ago. This is life. Yes. It is yeah. life. It is oh, Zoe, yeah. the, mm. the God kind of life. It's the breath of God. Mm. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says the word of God is. It's the breath of God. The breath of God. Therefore, it has life. Every word of God is God-breathed. That's what the Bible actually says when it says that, um, in, in Hebrews, every word is the breath of God. It's God breathing. Hallelujah. For which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The word no there, you know, to to our mind. You see, the English language is a very limited language. Very, very limited. That's because the English took from everybody <laughs> to form their own language. If you do 
If you do a study of the history of the English language, they took from the Greek, they took from Latin, they took from French, they took from, you know, and then that's how their language became. But the word no there is a very deep word. It's the word intimate. I'm intimate. I'm intimate with whom I believe. Verse 13, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast said of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in you. Again, remember, Apostle Paul knew that the time is drawing near. And he needed to put fire in somebody. He needed to encourage this man and say, Don't, that word of God that you receive, that's what you stick to. That's what you preach. This dad knoweth that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phagilus and Hermogenes, because what happened, they all forsook him. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Okay, so this man Onesiphorus, remember, this is how we actually knew that when Paul was isolated, no one knew where he was. They just put him away in, in prison. And this man, listen to verse 17, he said, But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. That means the man was searching. You know, they kept him away in a secret location. Nobody knew where he was. Or none of his friends knew where he was. I want you to just imagine yourself in that state. It's a very terrible state to be in. All for the sake of the gospel. But thank God, God brought this man. And the man searched and searched and searched for him. When we do, um, yeah. So this man searched for him diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, wow. that knowest very well. So Paul is trying to say, look, I don't need to say too much about this man. You know him more than I do. He was a good man. Mm -hmm. Everybody forsook me. Nobody came. You know, this man was lonely. All for the sake of the gospel. And he decided to put pen to paper to write to one person that he knows, that he trusts. That he knows. You remember when he wrote a letter to the, was it the church in Corinthians or Philippians? I can't remember now. He said, this is one man, he was talking about Timothy, this is one man that I know that has your best interest at heart. He's not like any other uh, disciple. You know, he's somebody who really cares for you. And so that's the character of this man, Timothy. And guess what? When Paul was so, when he knew that the time was up and it's time for him to leave, you know, he wrote a letter to, to this Timothy because he knows he's somebody that can be counted on. And that's where we're going to end it today. When you look at yourself, when you look at yourself, are you, are you somebody that God can count on? Like Onesiphorus, who went and sought out diligently Paul in his time of difficulty just to encourage the man. Are you one that God can count on? Or are you one that's going to bail out just like the rest? They all bailed out. They all forsook him. Are you one that God can count on? Mm. And believe me, in this day and age, in this day when there are many, many false prophets, when there are many, many magicians, when there are many, many uh, Hollywood actors in the church, are you one that God can count on that will uphold the tenets of the faith, that will hold on to the truth of the gospel? Any questions before we... So true what Christian says. Um, I just like to share a scripture that you know, um, you know, back up you know, like knowing this first with no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Mm -hmm. Prophecy never came.